All right, guys, how's it going? Welcome back. Welcome to Spain. I was going to say welcome to sunny Spain then, but it's not that sunny today. Today I'm in something a bit unusual. It's this Cupra Formentor. I'll be honest with you, when I picked up this car from Malaga Car at the airport a few days ago, I didn't have a clue what it was. I was just relieved they didn't give me a Duke or a cash guy. Since then, I've done some research, so I do know a bit more about it. Try and wrap your head around this. You've got VW, a German company. They own Seat, a Spanish company. And Seat mainly make rebodied VWs. Then they name them after places in Spain. And I like them generally. Yes, underneath you've got a dull VW, but at least it looks a bit more stylish, has a bit more Spanish flair. Now, Seat used to make performance versions of its standard cars and then call them the Cupra. Cupra was like their GTI or ST. It was always the hot version. So you had things like the Leon Cupra or the Ibiza Cupra and so on. Then a couple of years ago, for reasons which still remain unclear, Seat decided to make Cupra its own standalone brand. It's been marketed as their sporty performance car division. It has a new logo too. And this Formentor, which is named after a part of Mallorca, is the first car designed specifically for Cupra. Are you following me so far? Good. Clear as mud, isn't it? They've obviously cottoned on to the fact that nowadays people are fawning to buy crossovers and small SUVs. It's a huge, highly competitive market, so why not make more of them? The Formentor's been around since 2020. It was a good year to release a new car, wasn't it? And it's roughly the same size as an Audi Q3. Firstly, can we just take a moment to focus on its styling? I think it looks awesome. I love the new logo, and I love all the rose gold accents. It looks really classy. It's very sporty and aggressive, and I love the lights. I love the wheels. I love the overall shape and the sharp lines. It's all very precise. It isn't a full-blown SUV, it's more of a jacked-up hatchback, but it's got good ground clearance. I think it works really well. This proves that crossovers don't have to be boring. I mean, look at cars like the Stonic, the Kona, the Lexus UX. They all look like cars that a pensioner would take to the post office. This doesn't. Every time I've gone anywhere in this, every time I walk back to it in the car park, I think, that's a really good looking car, you know. They've done a good job. As we move around the side to the rear, if anything, it gets better. I love the horizontal light bar, which at night looks quite menacing. I could do a Matt Watson now and find a stick and jeer at the exhaust, which are non-existent, but I shan't. That sort of thing doesn't exactly keep me awake at night. I think it looks good, whether the exhausts are real or not. In addition to that, you get plenty of ground clearance, which is great for Spain. Great if you've got a steep driveway too or if you've got a bad back for that matter. It's a really easy car to get in and out of. And you know, if you go over a bumpy road, you won't rip the sump off. In front of me is a Mark IV Golf V6 4 motion. That is a rare car. Wow, wow, wee wow. Moving inside, the modern design continues. The steering wheel and gauges look as though they've been lifted straight out of a Lamborghini Urus, which is a possibility. Don't forget VW also own. Please wait a moment. That's so irritating. I love the digital gauge cluster, which is fully customizable. It's really useful, actually. I love how you can have it show full screen maps or traditional gauges. You also have these nice paddles on the steering wheel, should you wish to change gear yourself. They're not the quickest to respond though, to be fair. I love this wraparound dash. It's like a Jaguar XJ and at night time it lights up red. It's really dramatic. If you opt for something called a safety pack, then you get a blind spot monitoring system. So at night, if something's in your blind spot, you'll get this amber light here instead of the red one. And the materials that they've used are all really upmarket. I know it's a cliche when talking about car interiors, but it is genuinely a nice place to be. I'm sure you probably finished that sentence then before I did, but it is. Because this car's automatic, it uses a seven-speed DSG system, you don't get a traditional gear lever. You get this stubby little gear lever here, which I'm not a big fan of. It's used in a whole range of cars from the Volkswagen Audi group, from the Golf all the way to the 911. I just don't think it looks very good, nor is it particularly user-friendly. On the bright side, you get plenty of storage for your things, a nice comfortable armrest, two cup holders, space for your keys. It's all as though it's been designed by a human for a human, which is rare. One thing I do like, actually, is the fact that they've given you somewhere for your car key. All too often these days, car manufacturers make a car keyless, but then they don't give you anywhere to put that key. Well, Cupra have. If you go for a high-spec model like this, then you even have things like a heated steering wheel. Usually on most cars, you either have it on or off, but on this, you can select varying levels of heat. Starting at lukewarm, all the way up to molten lava. There's also wireless Apple CarPlay and a wireless charging point. 
It's all very clever stuff. There are a few things I don't like though. For example, the buttons down here that control the lighting. I don't know who thought that was a good idea. That was almost certainly the decision of an accountant. It just stinks of money saving. They're just touch buttons, so there's no feedback. Again, it's just not very user friendly. My biggest issue though with this car is this infotainment screen. It's needlessly fussy. There's no volume knob down here like you get with an Audi. It's all touch screen and it does my head in. I'm sure it seemed like a good idea when the car was stationary in the factory, but on the road from Mijas Pueblo to Alarín El Grande while you're trying to overtake a 30-year-old Seat Marbella, not so much. In fact, I'd go as far as to say it's dangerous. Why don't they just put a control system in down here? That way you wouldn't have to take your eyes off the road. And without wishing to sound like a boomer, there's just too much tech in this car. It's almost like the machine's trying to take over. It constantly beeps at you and displays warning messages. Beep, you're approaching a roundabout, take your foot off the accelerator. Yes, I know I'm approaching a roundabout. I'll take my foot off the accelerator when I'm ready. Beep, you strain out of your lane. Yes, I know I'm straying out of my lane. I'm on the N340 at night and there's nobody around. It doesn't matter. Beep, speed exceeded. Yes, I know I'm over the speed limit. It's because I'm in Tormelinos and I don't want to be. I've had this for three days now. See, it's just said it again, foot off accelerator. You just feel like saying, Cayete ya! Cayete tonto! But by far and away, the most annoying feature of this car is this voice recognition system. In theory, it's a good idea. You can use it to change the radio station or call somebody from your contacts book. But in reality, it doesn't work. It's always there, eavesdropping. It's like a nosy neighbour. It's constantly chipping in. Can I help you with something? No, you cannot. Every time you try and sing along to a song you like, it thinks you're talking to it. So it turns the volume down on the song and then tries to start a conversation with you. Leave me alone. Let me try and demonstrate. Hoy te visto con tu libro caminando y tu carita de Please say the address, starting with the city. What are you talking about? Leave me alone. All I want to do is sing along to a song, which I think is about a predatory paedophile, but I'm not 100% sure. It is so irritating, honestly. And I haven't found a way to turn it off. I'm sure there is a way, but it'll be buried deep within this system. And life's too short. In terms of space and comfort, then it scores very well. There's plenty of headroom, plenty of legroom, plenty of elbow room. It's all very good. And the visibility is pretty good. Actually saying that, if you look through the rear view mirror, then the rear window is quite shallow and narrow. But the rest of it's pretty decent. Moving to the back seats, there's genuinely a lot of space. Way more than you'd expect from a small crossover. You see the sloping roof line and you assume that the rear space is only fit for Marie Antoinette, but it isn't like that at all. Moving back further still, the boot's a good size at 450 litres, although there's quite a big lip which is annoying. It means you've got to heave your shopping and your luggage over that lip just to store things in the boot. Which isn't the most clever design, is it? Which isn't the most clever design, is it? It's a very safe car, this as well. It's got top marks at Euro NCAP, and it even, unlike the GLC I filmed with recently, has front Isofix points. Anyway, enough of that boring stuff. You're probably wondering what it drives like. Being the first car from this sporty new brand with rallying heritage, you'd expect it to be a riot, wouldn't you? Well, I'm sure if you go for the high performance version, then it is. But this 150 horsepower model seems to have the motor from a Kenwood Chef. It isn't the quickest, the torquiest, nor does it sound the best. It feels, honestly, just like a Golf. Its looks are writing checks this engine cannot cash. On top of that, the ride's quite firm and a bit crashy. It handles well, but the steering's a bit too light and vague. That all sounds quite negative, doesn't it? Well, it's not that bad. It's quite a pleasant car to drive and be in. As an everyday car to use to go to the supermarket or to the bank, it's good, it's fine. It's quiet and very easy to drive, and the seats are quite comfortable. It's just that based on its looks, I was expecting to be grinning like a Cheshire cat, and I'm not. Under the bonnet of this one is a 1.5 litre four cylinder turbocharged petrol engine which produces 150 horsepower, and it's totally unremarkable. It is good for about 40 miles per gallon though on average, which is quite impressive for a petrol. There's a two litre petrol on offer with 190 horsepower, now that would be the one I'd go for. Or if you want to get car dragged at knife point, there's a 310 horsepower model. I think in fact it's the same engine as featured in the Golf R. That's probably the only model worthy of the Cupra badge. It's the ideal car if you like to engage in some light armed robbery and like playing cat and mouse with the police. There's also a plug-in hybrid version and it's available with four-wheel drive, so it's quite a versatile car. Although saying that, for us in the UK, there's no diesel option. 
From new, it comes with a three year or 60,000 mile warranty, which falls short of the five years you get from most car makers, or the seven years you get from Kia, or the 10 years you get from Lexus or Toyota. Three years just doesn't give you much confidence, does it? I had a quick look on Australia before and you can pick these up used from about £25,000, which does make this an interesting proposition. I think if I were in the market for this kind of car, I'd genuinely consider one, just for its rarity value. You hardly ever see them. I'm a self-proclaimed car nerd and I didn't even know what one was. It's the kind of car that I'd probably lease or get on some sort of PCP deal, then after two or three years you can just throw the keys back. That way you won't have to worry about replacing the mechatronic unit when it hits eight years old and it costs you £2,000 for a new one. For its looks alone, I'd be tempted. Most crossovers look so dull and boring. The Formentor doesn't. This is the crossover for people who haven't given up. This is the crossover that will make you turn back for a second glance once you put your key in your front door. Well, I think that's about it. So thank you once again for watching. Make sure you give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Sígueme on Twitter, Instagram, el Facebook, LinkedIn. And yeah, see you next time. Cheers, guys.